something very simple, which is how close can you get to the bird? And for the most part, you can't get very close. So uh, we recommend at least a 400 millimeter lens. Um, now, if you have a, a, a DX rather than FX, that gets you to, uh, as you know, about 600 millimeter, which is really fantastic. Um, and so I'll show you, first of all, here's, here's our 400 millimeter, and if you can see it, all right, this is our 400 millimeter F3.5. It's just a monster to hold. Um, but um, the F3.5 is really important because obviously birds are moving, unlike mammals or architecture or studio portraiture. Um, they're not waiting for us to decide when prime time is to take a picture. The lens that I use most often career-wise is something that's quite unbelievable actually in length. So it's a 560 millimeter Leica that was adapted to a Nikon mount. Um, it's a slow lens, it's a f6.8, but you can imagine then with a 1.5 magnifier on this 560, it's really quite long. The thing that I love about it, and, and for the most part, I, I used it originally in slide film when we were shooting back in before 2008 when we converted over to digital. This has a slide focus. So the focus actually goes this way rather than rotating this way. And so it allows me to be able to go and as the bird is moving, I can extend the lens or retract the lens to track the bird in focus without doing this sort of thing. And of course that's before all of the autofocus came into play. Um, We've used Nikon lenses uh, and Nikon cameras until a couple of years ago when Nancy first switched to uh, Sony RX10. And um, it's allowed us to get some pictures because it's a 24 to 600 millimeter built in uh, lens system in the camera, has great image stabilization, and um, uh, it does a really phenomenal job. Can you grab that? Sure. Yes. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is this is the whole unit. Turn it on here. And to go from 24 to 600, that's it. So to have a handheld 600 lightweight. And the other thing for us was um, just traveling in limited baggage instead of having a big pack of lenses, 400 and macro and whatever. The other thing is that this lens, unlike the 560 and the 400, um, would say that I could almost focus at 600 millimeter at this distance from me to the, to the camera where you're at, where you see me. So uh, it's allowed us to get uh, with a 600 millimeter to photograph bumblebees in flight. So it's really, really a great camera. We, we enjoy it. Um, I've sold probably more Sony cameras for Sony without any commission whatsoever, just because of the results. So you'll see some of the, the photographs here. So any, any other questions before we start on uh, lenses? Okay. Have everybody muted. So if anybody has a question, feel free to. Okay. Well, we can we can move ahead. But essentially, I found that you know a 300 millimeter lens is just too short, particularly if you're going to do anything um, in a wetland or something where the birds are a little further away. By the time you get close enough to start filling the frame, um, they're flying away. Uh, obviously. Um, you want to be really good at hand holding, um, bracing your arm. And so I do this typically when I hold the lens. Oops. Uh, always the elbow against, against my body. If you're out like this, you'll never get it. So you guys know this already. I'm, I'm speaking to people that are almost professional. But anyway, 
you notice how steady, how steady this can be, that heavy 400 millimeter with one hand. And then when you press it up to your face, of course, it makes a big difference. But always, the elbow is never there right here, and now on my own tripod. The other thing that we did, if you slide over just a little bit. This way? Mm hmm Okay. Nancy and I would be partners, so if she's shooting or I'm shooting, she would brace it on my shoulder, I brace it on hers for steadiness, or we look for trees or rocks. But anyway, we're our own portable tripod, and a lot of times uh, tripods don't work with birds, because by the time you move the tripod, the birds have gone, and certainly in trying to track them in flight was an issue. So I think that's pretty much what we'll cover on, on the equipment. Anything else? So Tom, uh, you're saying that the, when you brace it, you're also putting the hand at the balance point? Uh, it's pretty much exactly that, yep, on the, on the lens. So we look at it here. So you can see it. So there's, there's where you'd put it on the tripod, which is the balance point. Right, great, great question, Fred. Yep, so it's at least that far, but then I also can take and turn my focus like this. So it wasn't until two years ago that we ever went to an automatic focus camera. Okay. I guess the only other thing that I would add to that is a good pair of binoculars is a good thing to have along with your camera on a any kind of birding trip because it's sometimes easier to just spot the birds where they are with a pair of binoculars and then and then get your uh, your uh, camera into position to shoot what you want to shoot. So. Okay. Okay. Share the screen here. All right. I'm going to share it this way. that okay for everyone? Looks good. Okay, well, uh, and Sam asked us about doing a, a program some time ago. Um, we thought about it and decided that it would be fun to do a nature program since Nancy and I both love birds so much. It's for the birds is the title of our program tonight. And uh, we'd like to certainly thank all of you for choosing to spend this evening with us on a virtual tour of one of our favorite photographic subjects, the birds of the planet. And here we are. And would you like, we'll, we'll try to identify birds as we go along so that people know. You want to say what that is? Sure. This is, um, and it's hard to tell in the silhouette. It's either a Clark's or a Western Grebe. And the birds in the opening uh, frame were pintails, right? Yes. I believe. Okay. So we'd like to start by stepping back a couple of centuries, actually, because before there were millions of photographers, there were about half a dozen incredibly talented and dedicated illustrator, poet, natural uh, historians who really began the great artistic and scientific endeavor of observing birds, learning their behavior, writing about them, and recreating them with pen and ink and paint. And here's Mark Catesby. We're not certain how his not name is pronounced, but he was uh, an English naturalist who wrote Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands, and uh, published uh, the first published account of flora and fauna in the North American continent. And there were 220 plates in this published work done in 19, I'm sorry, 1754. And the image on the right that he painted is what's believed to be extinct in North America, the ivory-billed woodpecker. And next is, okay, there you go, okay. Alexander Wilson, and you all, you all may be familiar with some of these, these people, uh, an American illustrator, poet, and ornithologist uh, who wrote and illustrated American ornithology. 268 Paintings of Birds of America, published between 1808 and 1813. And their work was really, their work was really stunning. And at the same time, it was two-dimensional until this next, really flat looking until this next gentleman came along, uh, John James Audubon, who did the well-known uh, Birds of America, 430 hand-colored life-size prints of 497 bird species. 
and uh, Audubon was the first one also. Other people did pretty much field work. He, he d decided to, for whatever reason, kill birds sometimes and bring them into his studio where he would have a better chance to look at them in great detail. So we are now uh, all in that, in that um, history of, uh, of looking at birds and m many of us love birds for the many ways they bring joy and color and anticipation and even occasionally humor to our lives. Uh, and we're so we're continuing this this tradition of observing and documenting birds and their behavior. Only now we are using photographic and photo enhancement tools that can capture split second movement and close up images that continue to reveal new information about these marvelous subjects. So our overarching message this evening is the same as it would be for any other photo assignment. Know your subject. So every topic will involve both bird behavior and photograph photographer behavior. So I'll let Tom begin with some, maybe some more conversation about this collective image here. So the, the thing that, so is the species count, uh, as those of you that are into anything in natural history, much less birds, you know that there, there are groups of people that split species and those that combine them. And so, it varies depending on what they discover genetically as to which bird belongs to which species and so on. But essentially, there's over 10,000. And the amazing thing is each individual bird is unique and can be studied at great lengths of time and be pursued in great, great uh, domains of one's lifetime. I think the definitive study of the uh, um, English sparrow, the house sparrow we have around here, is, was done by a woman who uh, was pretty much confined to her house and she watched them and did the fundamental ornithology research on that bird uh, from her house. So <clears throat> when trying to identify anything that we do, it, it's important, like I, I think about people that I know that are great architectural photographers, they're great portrait photographers. And so they'll go and on tours, they'll study, they read books just on architecture and, st and structure. And the same thing is true for anything wild, for the wildlife or flowers, for instance. So here's the binomial nomenclature that Linnaeus set up. And this happens to be for the American robin. And <clears throat> what's interesting is the robin doesn't look very thrush-like as an adult, but as you can see from the wood thrush, hermit thrush, and the juvenile robin, that's where the spots are for the thrush for the robin. And so as a result of that, um, this is birds that perch. So we're gonna look at a number of different orders throughout our, our evening here. Family, all thrushes. Genus, similar thrushes. And then species, the American robin. And again, not, not be insulting or anything like that, but you'll notice that the genus name is capitalized and the species name is, is not. So each one of these birds, the uh, ibis, uh, oriole, avocets, and um, uh, hummingbird are, uh, come from different orders and it helps because when you're trying to identify it, and it, for us it's a lot of fun to go and see a bird and then identify it and then find out its behavior and study it. So bird books are organized by that, by order and then family, then genus, species. So relative to <clears throat> this whole thing of the photographic triangle, um, there's nothing new here at all from what all of you already know. So, right, you, you, have, you get to choose two of them and the third one is determined by the lighting, right? So if we choose um, our, uh, shutter speed and, and ISO, then the aperture is going to be adjusted based on um, the amount of light that you have in order to get a good exposure. So this bird uh, was taken over on the eastern shore and um, early morning, backlit, and um, the issue always is when you're using a long lens, and this was my 560 millimeter that I showed you, um, 
shutter speed versus depth of field, right? And so most often the longer the lens, the narrower the focal length in terms of depth of field. That, and so um, focus becomes extremely critical. And we're gonna talk about it more, but if you can see that the uh, shadow of the bird here is not in sharp focus. The legs and I, I was interested in, of course, the body and always the eye of the bird. If that's not in focus, that's, that's a throwaway for us, as well as the foam that was coming in. So in this sense, the focus had to be right at the bird with enough depth of field to be able to go and uh, see the foam coming in. Um, had I focused in front of this, it would have been okay. Um, but in, in this case, the foreground is not particularly a, a, an issue for us. Here, I needed a very sh fast shutter speed. Uh, these are winter centerlings uh, over on, um, I think, by Cape May, um, flying. And here, um, so that I had enough depth of field to cover the birds, um, the focus was on the closer birds, and you'll see now that the foam's out of focus. But it doesn't particularly bother me. So I'm making decisions on water birds all the time. Where's the primary focus? Where's their eye that is the sharpest? Um, and then a shutter speed that's fast enough to capture the action or blur it if I choose to. So you can see that there's some blurring going on where the wing is up over here and over here. But again, I don't mind that. I find that sometimes if I freeze the birds completely, with, you know, 4,000 or 8,000th of a second, it doesn't really always look natural. So we expect some motion and we accept a little bit of blur. Hmm. So the image here was uh, in a blind in a, a wetland in Minnesota. Um, this is a trumpeter swan that was uh, swimming. And um, I had to watch and then again, make a decision, okay, can I let the upper left corner burn out? Um, where is my focus going to be? And because I was in a blind and the bird is fairly close, I had enough depth of field with a shorter focal length lens to get the reeds and the swan. Um, so I normally don't ever use um, trigger shutter, you know, six frames a second or anything like that. It, it freaks birds. Uh, secondly, so I make a decision and I get one shot. And in this case, I waited until the bird, you can see the, the pattern behind the bird there in the water making a slight turn. As soon as it made the turn, I had to take the picture so it had, didn't go inside of that reed. So it was compositionally a little open space where I wanted the bird to, to fit. And so I watch its behavior and then try to anticipate. And uh, we'll get into leading in terms of how we see that in a minute. And this is a photo that I took uh, many years ago. A lot, a lot of some of these, many of the photos we'll show you tonight are film that have been uh, transferred to digital. And this is one of them. And so uh, it just, I used to walk around this wetland a lot. It was just a lovely uh, kind of place. And I happened there in this particular evening to have this very calm scene of birds and, and water and a little bit of a sliver of moon up there and some interesting clouds coming in and just nice leading lines everywhere and this most unusual lavender color which hasn't been uh, enhanced at all and so that was a that was a real I, lo I love landscapes and I, I would say one of the things that we'll, we'll be showing a lot of this evening are images that are, that are not necessarily tight shots some people like to shoot very tight on birds and animals. And I personally like shooting landscapes myself, but Tom and I have both, uh, as Samantha uh, indicated, shot for uh, a, lot, a lot on assignment and for the Fish and Wildlife Service where we're telling stories about uh, birds and migration and habitats and often for the, the, the purpose of uh, uh, preserving land or working with landowners to get easements. So the stories, we can have a few really close ups, but we tend to tell stories more by having more in the frame than maybe some others would like to shoot. So 
from an exposure perspective and, and um, what, what I found uh, in, in the film days, now you know, I assume everybody's shooting uh, raw format, so you have a great deal more latitude. But what I found is that I had to be very careful, particularly with white birds, and there's a lot of birds that are white, right? Gulls and egrets like this and so on that depending on how close or how far away from me uh, from a visual perspective in, in the frame um, the animals were, if it was far away, I found that I om almost always benefited from at least uh, one third to two thirds underexposing because uh, the bird was gonna burn up. It was reading the water or the reeds. Um, the, uh, it's going to brighten the, the image in terms of the auto exposure. And uh, as I got closer, as you get closer and closer to the bird, like, like the uh, snowy egret going after a fish on the left image, um, that the exposure was compensated. The blue water and the white was fine. But as the birds got further and further away, particularly in bright sunlight, um, uh, I just found that underexposing it was a little better. And it didn't matter whether I used raw or not, I just prefer to get as optimal an image before I start. So let's see, I need to, um, it's, sorry. Um, I hit the mouse button and everything <laughs> went kaput. Okay, so the same thing applies um, on, on the one third, two thirds in terms of depth of field that everybody's familiar with. Uh, so here's a, mountain scene south of Anchorage uh, on Turnagain Arm. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's 24 millimeter lens. And of course I needed to focus, I'm approximating where the dot is there for the focus, but I had to focus fairly closely for the one thirds, two thirds relationship. Um, if I was going to bring you know, the lupin in very close to me and, and in terms of focus, but the same thing is true here, only now with a long lens and a smaller subject, uh, very close up. Uh, I give consideration always to the one third, two thirds, if I have time. Now, if there's a bird flying as Nancy and I say, get a picture, it doesn't matter what, at least it's a record shot to start with. <clears throat> but the ratio here of one third, two thirds makes sense. So in this case, I didn't focus on the eye, I focused on the feathers the two thirds brought me in focus back to the eye and the one third just in enough detail here in front of the gull, between the gull and me, uh, for the uh, reflections to be in focus. So the thing that I do is, uh, and speak for both of us, we take pictures we don't care about, okay? We get here, there's a gull swimming around, it's got bad feathers or whatever. We'll still get, take some pictures, get the light, determine you know, what f-stop is optimal, is it blurring or not, and then when a bird of more interest comes in, we've already got all of those set up because a lot of times you just have seconds before you need to shoot. So we'll say a little bit about composition here too, not that all of you don't already know that, but um, usually we're looking at uh, the, the rule of thirds. So put place the primary subject in the top third center third or bottom third or left center right third of the image to have good balance and this uh this happened to be at my sister's house in iowa on a very snowy day on the back of their uh, uh settee outside that they weren't using hadn't been for months because of the snow all over it but anyway that's that's kind of uh how we approach pretty much everything um and it's just after a while, it just becomes uh, second nature a good many of the photos, particularly, again, in, in landscape environments with wider shots. It's nice to get some the foreground object uh, subject in the lower part of the frame and then the habitat itself in the upper two thirds to give uh, a real sense of the environment. And this uh, and this is Tom's great shot. I'll let him talk about that. Oh, well, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> so um, I, I bring cameras everywhere. So I was, I was out um, uh, at a 
cemetery um, uh, winter time when I went back to Minnesota where my dad is buried and I brought my camera and I, I thought it was kind of cool that he, he loved these animals and he loved nature and it was a beautiful place. And so with no disrespect to my father, I honoring him, these turkeys were going by in huge numbers in the snow. And uh, I just loved the leading lines. Again, I, uh, the previous one, as well as this and, and the uh, Cardinal, there's something about leading lines of birds, particularly when there's multiplicities of them. So I use it a lot. Uh, what was interesting is they were walking in the bright area so I had automatic shading in the lower left foreground from the shade of the trees and then shade beyond it. So they were highlighted as if we had had spotlights. So it was just a wonderful um, uh, place to expose it. So this was taken up on um, the south shore of Lake Superior in Wisconsin. And uh, Nancy was noticing some things about the shadows here that she can point out. Yes, I really, I love that. I was thinking about what it took for him to get this shot. And I, what lens did you say you had? Uh, this Six. was, I think, um, um, either 200 or 300. Okay. So this bird had been walking back and forth along the shoreline. And there's seldom heavy waves coming in here. You can get hit some heavy surf, but this was a calm day. And uh, so uh, you, this is a situation in which you would want to be just following that bird from pick it up from some distance and let let it keep walking until you get just the framing that you want to see. And he did a great job of the, the shadow coming from the bird. You see, get to see both the legs and the bill. And then if you notice coming out from the from the heel of the, the foot, there's a shadow, there's a reflection on the little bit of water that's on the uh, on the shoreline there that is reflecting the yellow that's on the leg that's lit by sun and then reflecting the warm underbelly of the, the bird at the same time and then just beautifully capturing bubbles and uh, just a little surf coming up. So it's, a lot of times that's what it takes, get the bird in the frame and then wait for it to do something or follow with it and then take the shot. The other thing that uh, we both do is to pay attention to the bird's legs so that there's some prime action. Everybody knows about prime action, peak action in sports or whatever it is. Um, and a lot of times the mo movement of the head, uh, wings and legs are really things that, that we pay attention to. Um, so the next thing is, you know, the kind of the guideline about that composition of odd numbers is, is um, more desirable than uh, pairs is hard if you have two subjects, one on either end in a frame. So in portraiture, obviously, you either try to have, you know, three or if there are two people, they're connected so that it appears compositionally as one, right? Pretty standard stuff. But in this case here, this worked out because these uh, Blackneck stilts um, out near San Francisco um, provided a perfect um, set. And, and I took a lot of pictures and the heads were not right or there was movement or there was blur. But in this case, I found that the head of the bird on the right looking one way, another bird looking towards me and the other one, like I'm bored with this whole photography thing, I'm gonna rest, um, was a great composition in terms of threes. Also very interesting that the uh, birds, of course, can sleep standing on one leg and have, have great balance. And then uh, from an anatomy perspective, uh, it's, it's interesting, and we just were looking at this, that this right here, if you can see my cursor move, um, this bend right here is actually the equivalent to our heel on our foot. So this whole long extension is equivalent to the bottom of our feet. So it's interesting, and that's why, for instance, on the, you can see it on these long-billed curlews, um, they can move that forward. We move our bottom half of our leg backwards, right? But um, uh, their um, uh, knee is uh, essentially up in the feathers up here. So again, composition of two going to one so that there's a unity about this. And so I, I like it for that reason. And again, paying attention, these birds were feeding um, in the uh, salt uh, 
marsh environment here. And um, I took one picture, and this is the picture. I, I was watching the relationship of the heads of the birds and uh, obviously focused on the front bird. And um, it usually is the case that we can tolerate the background being out of focus, but it's very difficult for us unless certain conditions that the foreground is uh, not in focus. So um, this is uh, with, with our Sony cameras. Now, Nancy and I last year spent a lot of time in the North Woods uh, working with warblers. And the challenge with warblers, I mean, it's just awful. They're back in the trees, they're chasing insects and so on. But um, with our short focal length lens at the Sony, we were able to get um, pictures. Uh, this is a magnolia. And then this is, uh, we'll look at getting birds in flight at this point in time. This is another instance where uh, having a couple of a subject, a, a, a subject consisting of two works very nicely, one following the other through the frame and uh, nice uh, capturing of action and water coming off the back. And of course, at least from my point of view about my photography, a lot of these kinds of things are serendipity. You do the best you can to get the shot framed and and focused and be ready for something to happen and then uh, make sure you're steady and uh, when it when it does happen you know take a series of shots i i don't deliberately use uh trigger motion either but every once in a while i end up getting a burst of shots and and some of them will be better than others but uh, that that's one way to work it so one of the things again uh, watching at, as nancy was talking about Studying bird behavior is really valuable. So as the birds were sitting there, I took one picture uh, and then um, I looked at where, uh, was there any wind? Because birds, off, um, many birds take off into the wind, right? Just like airplanes at an airport. So um, uh, I learned that from a fellow at the Fish and Wildlife Service and I was standing at one end of the lake and all I was getting is photographs of the back ends of ducks flying the other direction. And he gave me advice. He said, you know, you might want to stand to where they're going to fly into the wind towards you and you might get better shots. And uh, just, you know, little things like that, understanding um, that behavior. The other thing that we'll look at in these flight shots is uh, how much space to leave for the birds to fly into. In other words, a lead uh, you know, on the side. Standard composition things and what you do. So <clears throat> struggled for years trying to get pelican shots. And um, uh, this is one of those things where everything worked out. The light, the bird came close enough. I'd been tracking it. And then, so I got this one picture. Um, knowing behavior, a lot of times, uh, certain times of the day, the waterfall will take off to go out and feed. So you need to be there at that time and, and be able to capture when they begin to move. And this was a shot that I took down in the Bosque del Apache. It's called down in New Mexico. It's a great place to go. It's a little preserve down there uh, south of uh, Santa Fe. And um, it, it is just filled with migrating birds at certain times of the year. And I was, had been down there on a project uh, for a Minneapolis company and then uh, had some time to go over to the Bosque and had been there before, but hadn't really spent much time there and caught these snow geese lifting off all at one time. Huge, this is one of the great things to learn about watching birds is when, when, they are on, where, when there is a large collection of birds on a body of water, they will start to signal when they're getting ready to lift off en masse, unless of course something comes in to rile them and there were coyotes all over this, this refuge, so that would occasionally spook them. But for the most part, they'll have a plan to lift off and go feed this more. This is more early morning and late afternoon when they're gonna head off the water and, and go do some feeding for a while. And uh, they just, they'll start to ruffle their feathers, they'll start to talk to one another, it becomes quite a din. And then all of a sudden they just lift off en masse and it's a great chance to get just a, you know, this frame full of birds and feathers and, and all sorts of interesting graphics. So we've been uh, working, this, this is over at Blackwater Refuge. Um, those of you that 
you know, that area over in Maryland uh, on the peninsula. Uh, so anyway, bald eagles uh, nest over there, and this one was resting on the tree. So we split it up. Nancy was taking pictures of it sitting there, and I saw where the eagle was looking, and so I actually pointed my camera, not exactly where it was sitting, but over to the right of it, and then you get a shot. It either turns around or it doesn't go there, but in this case, um, I actually was prepared with my camera here, and the bird at the time was really almost on the edge of the frame before it took off. But by the time they make a decision and birds lift off, uh, you can't be positioning your camera where they are. Uh, this one was a rare one. I, my 560, I was in a boat filming for the Park Service in the Everglades, and the spoonbill flew right overhead, and I almost fell out of the boat leaning backwards to get the shot. And um, But anyway, managed to get it in focus again, one shot. So uh, Nancy and I each have our own thing about the nature, and so she can talk about insects. Um, for me, it's um, height, and uh, so I, I don't even like looking over the edges of bridges, but working with the Fish and Wildlife Service all the time, they say, you know, you're going to get a very good shot, Tom, if you go up in this 450-foot high you know, um, uh, forest tower. And so I go up with my lens, it's early morning, it was frost here, this was in North Dakota. Um, but it was really worth the shot, but it almost looks, I mean, the height is enough that it almost looks like I'm in an airplane, but this was taken from a tower as the Canada geese were living off. I think this was Jake Clark Salyer in Northern North Dakota. And the, uh, this is a lesser yellow legs and it was over uh, off Bombay Hook, I think, refuge mm -hmm. on the, Delaware Shore, and the bird on the right is a, is a grebe that, that it's one of Tom's shots, but I got the yellow legs just kind of standing there slowly, uh, waiting and watching. Uh, and to just to the left was a bridge with water flowing, a, a creek flowing through there, and it was just dead calm except for where the bird was standing and, and beautifully reflected. And so that's wonderful to be able to find those. Just I, I used to be very slow to take advantage of things like that, but I've learned from Tom to just stop the car, get out, get the shot, whether it's convenient or not, and just make sure that you don't miss those beautiful moments if you possibly can get them. The one on the right is uh, Clark's Grebe um, in Nebraska. And uh, so two different, two different patterns behind the bird. The one from the Grebe um, is from the bird paddling, Nancy's on the left of the yellow legs is from the current going past the bird's legs and disrupting the current. And then um, uh, trumpeter swan, um, wetland in Minnesota. And you have instances where it'll be absolutely calm. You can see that there's a slight ripple from the bird turning here. And uh, because of its large size, it caused the reflection to be disrupted down below there. But doesn't bother me at all. So you talked about portraits and, and so um, uh, animal portraits. And we, we put this together for, for this evening, just thinking about, you know, sort of super close-ups where there's not a lot of distracting background and um, the bird kind of fills the frame much as we would think about if we were portrait photographers. So, and this happens to be an anhinga that was on a marsh over in uh, South Carolina that was right near the shore. This is uh, a, a barred owl in Minnesota. And I will candidly say that I was not up in a treetop perching opposite this bird trying to get a good portrait of it. This was a, at a raptor release and the birds were on uh, stakes waiting to be let go on not on stakes they were on stumps tethered to stumps and so this bird just sat so beautifully and I, I had like a, an 80 to 200 lens that I was shooting with I was that close to this animal and it has just turned out to be a favorite of of many many people who've seen it it's just such a remarkable bird so beautiful the feathers were all in great condition and nice reflections in the eyes in fact I think if you look closely you can see me in the left eye with my silhouette. So the um, 
even though this looks like a studio shot to the bald eagle, is the same place, uh, same area that the uh, lupin was in Alaska and Turnigan Arm is sitting up in a tree, uh, whitish background. And then in post-processing, I just added a white vignette to it. But um, this, this is not a studio shot or a captive bird at all. Um, Kestrel on the right had, uh, again, a very soft brownish background with uh, long lens, uh, depth of field just blurred the background and ma made it, I thought, for a nice portrait of the bird. Um, this was in Minnesota, ringneck pheasant in the grass. Um, and uh, there was a lot of activity going on between the male birds with interest in the female birds. And I was down in the grass uh, as they went by. Normally you can't get close to them, but I was there maybe two hours before the birds started moving. So very early in the morning. And this one is in Minnesota. Um, this little house sparrow that we have over at Giant or Wegmans or picnic benches or wherever it is, they're so prolific. But um, the carved wood and, and the rope and, and the, the fall colors just made a difference. So even though there's two subjects here, sort of the rope and the post, the, there is an overarching, <laughs> as I see it here, an overarching uh, element of the stalks coming to help bring it together. So I didn't, I didn't find it unpleasant in that regard at all. Uh, this was on the Missouri River. Nancy and I were canoeing. Um, and I was in the bow. Nancy was paddling. And this is a ruddy duck. And the, it was amazing that the, part of this river was covered with fl these flowers of the aquatic plants. And uh, so took quite a few shots. The bird was quite tolerant, male, male ruddy duck. Um, could actually get the water drops coming down his cheek and underneath his chin. <coughs> Uh, this is over at the refuge uh, on by Bombay Hook um, and uh, uh, barn swallow sitting on reeds. Again, very long focal length. I think the 560, which made it about a 780 or 800 or something like that. So enormous um, uh, blurring of the background to help portraiture. So long lenses really do make a difference in, in that regard. And so I think we'll talk next about habitats, obviously. Um, and it's lots of different things to be said about habitats, especially if you're going to be shooting birds, perching birds in the woods. They, it's interesting to learn, and you should have some good bird books. That would make all the difference in the world, who they actually make for pretty interesting reading. But they will tell you what, where the birds are in the canopy. And this is the red-headed woodpecker. He's up fairly high. I think this was on Jekyll Island, wasn't it? Um, it was just north uh, of there. Just north of there uh, in Georgia. That's right. And uh, so this uh, Tom got this photograph and with some very interesting, by blurring the background, that there were some interesting colors, different colors of the foliage. That's the other thing that you can get in the woods is just remarkable foliage patterns in the background. And then some, I uh, uh, can't think of the name of it all of a sudden, the the moss. moss, the Spanish moss hanging down there. So that's, uh, and just the brilliant uh, markings on that bird in, in large blocks of color that are so appealing. So one of the things that was difficult because we <clears throat> moved out to um, Leesburg in 2004, coming from Minnesota, other than the prairies in the west, there are a lot of, lot of trees there. And, and so we were used to shooting with something that was vertical in the frame. And it took me several years to get used to shooting on the beach because there's just, other than the sky or maybe the distant horizon, there was no verticality. So I, I really come, come to enjoy coming back again, going out into the woods where there's some verticality for the composition as compared with this. So um, again, when you have these salt marshes, um, Great, great, uh, beautiful. We, we love photographing them and the wildlife and the migrating birds. You can see over on the right hand side, very right hand side, uh, white dots there that are all snow geese. Uh, Canada geese flying overhead through the clouds. And this, this is a great sense of telling a story about fall migration, the fall colors, the birds migrating, 
the fact that they're flying in a V formation because aerodynamically the birds, other than the lead, uh, take advantage of the uplift of the other bird and that's why they always fly in that distance if they're going any distance. And so in, we, we'll talk some about stories. So this is out by um, uh, Morgan, Park. Morgan Park. And um, I just love the fence, the fall colors, the red-tailed hawks soaring and sunshine. So we'll focus now on um, a couple of specific habitats in a little more detail. So this is from Ireland where we were uh, visiting in 2016. And, uh, uh, didn't see a whole lot of birds there. Didn't see a whole lot of wildlife generally. It's very different from the things we're all accustomed to in this part of the world where there's uh, something, there's new wildlife around the corner almost everywhere you look. But so it was a bit of a challenge to find some, some, hab some wildlife there, but, uh, but, but there was no lack of gorgeous scenery. And uh, so these are, this is a photo of Tom's just getting these marvelous waves crashing. That's probably about what 50, 60 feet up that wall. Would you say that wave has traveled? Yeah. And so it's uh, it's a gorgeous scenery. One thing we did see there a lot of were rooks. I don't know that we have any in here. We had to trim some photos at the last minute. So, but they were they're kind of our equivalent of the crows and and ravens, and they were uh, flying around a castle at one point that we stopped at. So these sheer cliffs. Uh, interestingly, the um seabirds will come back just they'll be out at sea all except for nesting and so this is up in Newfoundland Nancy um, with a spotting scope taking a look at some of the birds these are gannets northern gannets yeah. and the masses it, it it looked like the whole cliff was covered with snow this is a, a popular point that some, some of you might even have been to called St. Mary's Point and uh we were lucky because oftentimes you can see there's a lot of fog offshore there. Oftentimes the whole area is just fogged in and we only had really one day to be there and it was uh, it was clearing and foggy and then uh, sunshine so we had ample opportunities to get some nice shots. And that's the other thing to be aware of is what's the weather like where you're going at whatever time of year or maybe you want to choose a time of year that would be best if you specifically want to get shots like this and know what your chances are based on how the weather is going to be at that time. And always, of course, take a variety of clothing so that you can deal with many of these places that we have shot at have been wet and windy and cold a lot of the time. So be sure to have warm enough gear and something to protect your camera deer from the rain. And, and the con you, can, you can be faced with just sheer condensation that will be more than you can contend with if you're not careful. So have have everything that you need to clean lenses and cameras and keep them as dry as you can. So uh, this, these are from two different locations. The low, lower uh, left is a whiskered auklet, a pretty rare uh, sighting. Uh, I've worked on a film uh, for Time Life and the Fish and Wildlife, two films out at the end of the Aleutian Islands in the Bering Sea. And uh, th this was a, a rare find. Very few people get to see that particular bird. The other three birds, uh, the upper left um, uh, horned puffin, upper right tufted puffin, and um, parakeet auklets in the lower right, I believe, uh, were all on St. Paul Island. We went up to photograph the fur seals out of the Pribilofs, and uh, the, the birding there was just incredible. So these birds, I mean, those are, you know, if you think about it, that's pretty much where they nest. The puffins tend to nest back in burrows in the, uh, just like the common puffin out here. And from any point where any one of those birds is located, it's about a sheer two to 300 foot drop, would you say? Yep. Yeah. So you have to be careful and it is, can be slippery underfoot. So looking at uh, coastline, uh, the, uh, we were camping over on uh, Assateague Island and um, a nor'easter was coming in. And so the wind was really picking up and so you'll notice all the gulls are looking in one direction into the wind. So when they turned around, their tail feathers flipped up. So they, they weren't about having that. So it made for a nice composition. Loved giving space to the shadows on the right. Um, now, I mean, in film days, of course, if you didn't get the horizon right, you were done for. But now with things like Photoshop and Lightroom and so on, it's, you can be a little sloppier. But I, I don't like to do that. 
So um, uh, we love photographing gulls. Um, they have such interesting behavior. Gulls can take three and four years in some species to become adults. And so it can be very confusing when you look and see ring-billed gulls and you're seeing these birds that you go in your bird book, well, what's that? Oh, well, that's a two-year gull or a three-year gull. Uh, the one on the right is just amazing. It's uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, Hartlub's uh, gull. And it was standing there and it was one of these things, all I had was my um, small zoom to 200 millimeter. I wasn't gonna get anything long distance, but the gull didn't care. And the building in the background had this beautiful framing in it of color and then the rock and the tree. And so I, I just, I find the image calming. And this was up out on the California coast, just north of Monterey. We had spent about a week out there and just getting wonderful shots everywhere. And we had just kind of were wrapping up our, our shooting day and came around to an area where there were otters in the bay. And we got some fun shots of those, but also just this nice, having been sailors in Minnesota and not being able to really use the boat we had there out here. It's always just fun still to go to a marina and, and see the, the wonderful colors and the masts and uh, in this case the fun point of, of the birds with the birds in the foreground. It just again tells kind of a nice story of, of life, on the, life on the coast. So this is with a 560 millimeter lens handheld um, manual focus. Um, it's, it's nice where birds are moving along the, the shoreline to be able to go and um, practice um, getting bad out of focus pictures. And uh, this is one that just turned out okay. And then um, again, with turns lifting off, there's uh, Caspian sandwich turns. Um, and again, the birds were critical, long lens, um, let the background go out of focus. Should we check and see if anybody has any questions at this point and uh, how we're doing on time here? I think we're, we're okay. We're doing great on time. Okay, great. So anybody have questions, just unmute and- I like had a point. Uh, way back uh, earlier, one of the initial photos, there was a picture of a uh, bird gold in the white background. And it brought to mind that there's a difference between uh, white sky and high key, and you actually transcended that so that it made it work. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, that's a great, great point. I, I don't know how many we have of the underneath part of birds, but it, one of the things photographing birds in, in the woods is that you've got white sky so much to um, contend with. So if you don't have ground and you have only white, you can really whiten it out and make it high key. Yes. Yep. Well, high key works if white sky is negative. Okay. So, Tom, uh, we got another question on the chat. I don't know if you saw it. But what are some tips to capture birds in flight? Um, we, I think we haven't come to that yet, have we? Uh, we yes, we did. It? Yeah, we've gone past it. Did we go past it? Yeah, we went past it <laughs> okay. without giving any tips. So I'll, I'll yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, we can back up if you like. We can do that. Um, or just. Um, so let me uh, go back up here. So this is, this is unusual in, in terms of flight because um, there's very little air. You, you'll see that, for instance, this, this bird is in focus and then this bird a little less so and then this bird, not so much. So probably the most important thing, and, and I was thinking about this and not, not that I equate myself to a, a cheetah in Africa, but what, what animals, that hunt in Africa do is to focus on a single animal and try to get that animal separated from the herd. So when, when we are photographing, for instance, all of the gannets, oh, if I go back up to the gannets up here, these two birds and this one I focused on and I followed, we were shooting motion picture or video as well. And so in, when I shoot in video, I will get an animal and I will track that animal. So if this one comes in and then moves out of the way, I stay with this one. So you sort of, like, like a 
cheetah or um, lion or whatever, you focus on one because you don't have a chance. So you can see over on here, for example, the number of birds, it's, it's almost so distracting, you don't know where to focus or what to shoot. And so what I would do, this one stands out right here, if you can see my cursor, the most. So I would pick that bird and then I would follow it. And if it went down like this and back up and around until it went out of some area where I'm turning my body too much and I can't track it. Or I might pick up a bird down here that's looking to lift off and use a long lens. And I would just watch them. And it did turn out that these two here uh, in video that we have, they were doing head nodding and looking up. And I knew that that head nodding was gonna lead to something. And then I was able to get a picture as one of these two lifted off. So I think the biggest thing is to find one, one bird and then just practice. Um, if you're using autofocus, um, it gets tricky if they move into a blue sky, for instance. And, and if, if there's not a lot of contrast in the birds, you'll find your zoom, your, your focus going in and out, rapidly focusing, right? So uh, if I have a chance, uh, and that's why I like more manual focus when I'm photographing birds flying, um, if I can think about it here, uh, I'll look at an area and then I'll let them fly into frame. So in other words, if these birds are coming, I might focus right down here on the sand and then lift my camera up and let them fly into frame and take the picture rather than trying to do a follow focus. So it's a couple of techniques, high shutter speed, um, for the most part, uh, handheld, just because uh, tracking them on a tripod is just difficult to do for me uh, on stills. And then uh, secondly, now if you've got uh, you know, an FX rather than a DX lens, you've got in 36 megapixel, you can zoom in. So one of the things you might do is to not zoom in so far because you get more depth of field, right? And um, you also can have a faster shutter speed with less issue and less, less vibration. So I don't know that I summarized anything, but. Um, I, I would just add something about photographing on like over at Blackwater. If you can get there at a time of day when you can be on, the, and this is probably obvious, be, be on the side of the bird where the sun is coming from so that you don't have uh, dark, undersides of birds and and that there can be some blue sky or some color around again sometimes there's just not much of anything you can do on an overcast gray day and things are flying overhead but anytime that you can get them at a lifting off at a lower level with sunlight coming into the frame from from behind you or from uh from the side that can often make for you know really nice photographs and more depth of field as well more yeah. faster shutter speed so the, it, it's like anything like um, playing a musical instrument or athletics or um, working on a computer keyboard, it, it's, it's practice. So I, we work out of our house um, far too much long, long before the um, stay at home <laughs> came in place. We didn't notice any difference ourselves um, time-wise, but um, so we have, we actually grow flowers in the backyard for birds and things like that. And I go out in the back and I practice things flying, bees, butterflies, cicadas, whatever it might be, um, as well as birds. And it's just a matter of practicing and I enjoy it. I mean, and I'll come in and for the most part, throw most of them away digitally, doesn't matter. But I practice and I enjoy the experience of the kinesthetics of taking pictures. And I think that could be very helpful as well. And then we have enormous opportunities here uh, in the Loudoun County area because our mountains are so close to the coastline. Not true in Carolinas, for instance, you have to drive several hundreds of miles to get there. So what that means is that in a short driving time, we can go from Montaigne to Piedmont to um, uh, saltwater and freshwater marshes. And so there's an opportunity to get a great diversity of butterflies, birds, flowers, and so on. So the, the Loudoun County Leesburg area is just perfectly positioned in terms of so many different in, environments. And you get to practice in the woods, you get to practice on the beach. And um, uh, the biggest thing is 
anticipate that there's going to be some motion. Watch the birds. Are they going to fly back and forth? Often these birds, terns, will fly back and forth along the shore. Pelicans, as you know, will fly back and forth across uh, just offshore. And so um, I'll actually frame and focus in front of where the pelicans are and let them fly into frame because it's just hard to track. And then sometimes if the water's moving, if you're using an autofocus, it goes in and out of focus and you've lost the picture. So that this helps. This would be a good time for a plug for the Nature Conservancy. Absolutely. <laughs> They've done phenomenal, yep. phenomenal yes. work here. Yep. Um, let's see, I should go back and get back where we were, were here. I think we're right mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we are flying out of... Uh, uh, Anchorage, An wasn't it? Anchorage, uh, no, Fairbanks. Fairbanks, you're right. And we're going north to a place called Canvasback Lakes uh, to photograph um, birds that were known to, to summer over there, including red-throated loons and so on. And we did some photography for the Fish and Wildlife Service in return for them flying us in and then flying back. Um, so the uh, uh, I had this inner tube that I built with some mesh over the top and some tarp and I waded in to the water as a floating um, uh, blind to get um, the, the grebes. And then this little guy was over there when Nancy and I were canoeing. And uh, so I'm going to tell on my wife here. So she says, now, you know, you're, you're not supposed to pick up the wildlife and whatever you do, don't feed them and don't pick them up. So we're photographing this little horned grebe come out of the nest. And then I look around in her canoe, and who does she have in her canoe that she's petting? So. Well, to be fair, we had attracted some gulls over to that area, and I thought it would, I was trying to protect it and keep it from getting consumed. But I did have to put it back in the water, so I'm guessing I didn't probably do it that much good. But anyway, it was I irresistible. Experience. So yes. Nancy can't, can't not see an animal and not care about it, so. So the Fena Pepla, so the desert offers incredible um, hummingbird environment. The saguaro cactus is background. Uh, male is on the left, the black. Uh, female is on the right. And uh, everything there is thorny. So um, <laughs> I've had more than my share of cactus spines that Nancy had to pull out or that a park service person had to use the pliers to get out of my hand. Um, but anyway, the, the environment is amazing, blue sky, and it's a wonderful area to go down and photograph in the winter. And the, well, where was it? That was uh, west, of, uh, west of Tucson, Phoenix area. And uh, mm -hmm. it was in, yeah. So here we are at, uh, this is one of the pools for those of you who've been to Cape May. And there's the, I forget the exact name of the lighthouse, but there's something called Lighthouse Point there. And there's some pools behind the dunes that have nesting uh, wildlife some of the time. And uh, the last time we were there, there was a beautiful pair of mute swans in there. This is uh, late evening, or early evening, I'm sorry. And uh, just beautiful water dripping off the, and again, kind of an interesting balancing act with the dark water and uh, yet the birds are in, in sunlight. And so, um, uh, you know, I've, I've grown very accustomed uh, to looking just to, to see what I've gotten in my, my frame and in my viewfinder and to see if it looks okay and, and shoot a variety of, of, uh, of shutter uh, of exposures and, and uh, then try to deal with issues, if any, when we got back. But got many wonderful shots there that evening. It's a great place to shoot and uh, get very close, pretty close to wildlife and bring it in very close with a uh, zoom lens. Also, the, probably you, you notice there's there's no real uh, strong white, maybe maybe up here on the back of this this swan, but uh, again, tonal value, and you can do that in Lightroom or Photoshop, of course. Um, but one of the things that is so is again, looking at white and how white is white. What is it? There's no th such thing really other than a pure 255, 255, 255 in an eight bit image, right? Uh, that's pure white. So uh, in this case, I really like what uh, what Nancy had and, and the tonality and the shading here um, and not letting that get burned out and actually 
not caring too much about the background that the, the, the black made for a nice mat around the birds, nice, wonderful ripples. Um, so I don't know why I'm, oh, I guess if I went back in here, then I'd be okay and it would work. Sorry. <laughs> there you can see it a little better. Wonderful uh, rippled reflections in here on both sides again. So she left space in front for the ripples and the reflections to be there. Um, this was over uh, by Cape May and you see the long plumes. So the springtime, very rainy. We go over there. I, some of you can't do it this year, but usually like about Mother's Day is a great day to go over to Cape May. That and the following two weeks. And so this uh, great egret um, uh, had all of its uh, mating plumes on there and they're just rich, lush uh, greenery. So uh, this was taken just here in Leesburg a number of weeks ago, um, hooded merganser in the left and a male um, uh, mallard just finished preening and uh, very interesting activities. Uh, it's a pond that is right at the end of Fairview where you go down to where you in, inter, intersect uh, Ida Lee. So anyway, if you come through town and you turn right, uh, there's not much going on now, but uh, spring before the birds leave uh, and over winter might be a great place, very local, go get some interesting birds like redhead ducks and, and uh, mergansers and, and so on. Um, speaking of mergansers, red-breasted merganser, this was uh, over on a salt area. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what goes on with the feathers on <laughs> the male birds of red-breasted mergansers, but um, evidently the females think it's good enough to have a nest with them. So um, uh, very interesting spring plumage. Uh, stick gathering is huge for birds. And so we always try to be out when they're building their nests. Uh, this is a tricolored heron down in Florida bringing a nest back to it, uh, I'm sorry, a stick back to its nest. And then we are photographing again over at Blackwater and Maryland and uh, ospreys were building their nest and great opportunity to get pictures of them in flight and fishing and uh, nest building. So this is where uh, the bird was going back and forth with sticks to its mate. So we positioned ourselves so that the, the osprey on the left would, would be fairly uh, close to where we're flying. And um, uh, something else on, on this, um, I will front focus, for instance, I will focus maybe just right up here on the bird as quickly as possible. And then as it flies into the frame, um, uh, I have the focus. If I try to focus back here, the bird, by the time I get it in focus, the bird is gone. So again, anything you can do to lead the bird in terms of focusing, I think on, on flying birds is helpful. Um, this is uh, eagle up in uh, Northern Ohio, eagle nest with uh, eaglets. And it's amazing. They just don't know what, when to quit hauling stakes. One thing I liked about this, cause I tried to get the same shot, but I was much closer to the tree. Tom shot from farther back at a pretty good size distance with a longer lens. And it almost looks as if he's somewhere up in the canopy toward that height. He was able to get a, more of a head-on shot as a result of the distance that he was away from it. My shots uh, barely showed the eagle's heads poking up there. So I learned a lesson from that. And then the, the real challenge is back in the <clears throat> woods with warblers. So this is a yellow warbler male on the right singing and a female uh, on, a, on a nest. Um, the male uh, was, was not with this female. It was two different times. The female was up uh, in upstate New York and this male was uh, in Northern Ohio. Um, we love warblers. Um, the Sony cameras have made a difference for us now because they're back in the woods, lots of brush. And uh, a long lens like a 400 or 560 um, can get it, but there's so much in the foreground. So we are able to get much closer um, with our small lenses. The birds on the right were, uh, these are little baby uh, red-headed black 
back, I, I'm sorry, red headed blackbirds, red, red winged blackbirds, uh, down just down a few blocks from where we used to live in Minneapolis. I mean, there are so many, any, any little marsh, any little wetland, this was actually about uh, seven or eight acres, so it was a pretty good size, but it had cattail marshes all along the edge and all kinds of wildlife in there. So we waded into this one uh, uh, at a certain point and the, the, the mom was away gathering food and all it takes for, is for her to light and those birds will open their bills and, and seek for food. And she, so she, just her arriving will rattle those cattails. Well, we rattled the cattails just a little bit, enough to get this shot and then got out of there. And so that was, that was a fun thing. And again, knowing what the birds do, what kind of behavior they have. And then Tom can talk about the peregrines. So, uh, so the, the one on the left are uh, peregrine, falcon, chicks uh, up in the Arctic Circle. Uh, we went up and photographed polar bears up there and um, uh, someone knew the area where the falcons were located. And so we got in and, and about a minute or two got the pictures and then got out. Um, but not all of the eggs hatch it with for birds of course and you see that here that three are, are doing just fine and the other one for some reason didn't hatch but telling a story uh, about leaving the egg in rather than getting it out so that you know there's again these are animals they're living things they're, they're like um, human beings in many ways they have all of the behaviors in, in a similar fashion um, the alligator here is of interest because in in the Florida Everglades, um, in, in the dry season, the alligator holes that they dig out concentrate the fish. And the birds then that are nesting, like the egrets, um, can go and get food without having to fly so far. What happened, uh, the project I work with the National Park Service, is that Florida began building all of the drainage ditches, and then they, they agreed to uh, give the the same amount of water to Florida, but over an even amount of time. So there was never a drawdown in the water. And the egrets were flying to feed, get food for their young, but by the time they found it, they had to eat the, the fish themselves and the young were starving. So interestingly, having a drawdown, having a dry season in the Everglades is as important as having a water season. And so anyway, it made a big difference, worked with the Corps of Engineers, the National Park Service, the Florida, um, hydrology people, and that helped the Florida Everglades start to come back. And this was, uh, this is a little marsh uh, just off the southwest quarter of an intersection of the, uh, the Greenway in uh, Northern Virginia and, um, and I never can remember the crossing. Anyway, it's, a, it's been turned into a nice little wildlife area with uh, uh, boardwalks and we were just there one afternoon actually practicing for some video for a shoot that we had to do later on that week and came around the corner and here was this wonderful looking goose family in this just a wonderful family out for a stroll is what it looked like on a Sunday afternoon it reminded me of my childhood because that's what we always did and I caught the the male just in perfect with his uh, his reflection down in the, the water, open water there and all the little ducklings, goslings were uh, in good view and just really enjoyed that photograph. So as Nancy was talking about <laughs> earlier, sometimes the habitat shots are as interesting as the close-up portraits. So having something beside your long lens, I guess, I guess that's the nice thing about the Sony 24. Uh, looks like there's some more questions up there. Let's see if I can read them. I, I can't read them from here. Oh, yes, you can. Go, go back again and select chat. Here we go. Oh. So. Oh, okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, great. So we'll just keep going if, unless there are some more questions. This was again up in uh, Northern Ohio at a place where warbirds were migrating through in great numbers and uh, just off, to, I, I took this series, there was a, a palm warbler in a clearing and it was late afternoon, just behind me and to my left, there were, were a lot of people trying to get a, a very difficult to see shot of a Kirtland's warbler, in, which is a fairly rare species 
in, in the brush and I knew I didn't stand a snowball's chance. So I just was wandering around and I saw this bird in the clearing, uh, this beautiful little palm warbler just doing all kinds of preening and fluffing his feathers and cleaning his feathers. And he was completely oblivious. I was kind of behind a bush, but I had a good shot through it again with the long lens and, and uh, in the open space. And it was just really wonderful to have that time and get as many different varieties of shots as I possibly could. And then this was kind of in the same location. This is a wood thrush, uh, which is a very hard bird to see. They are on the forest floor much of the time or way up in the canopy. This bird was foraging on the, the floor and uh, just taking its time moving along. And I was on the boardwalk and had really good opportunities. This is some of the most portraiture work I think I've done between the, the palm warbler and this bird to really be able to get close up to these birds and get uh, luxurious shots and keep the, I, I focused on the, the, the bird itself and let the, uh, let the background go completely out, got good separation that way. And then, but got just enough of the forest floor in so that it's possible to see what the habitat was like there. So the uh, thing that, I mean, this is really rare for us because the, the birds can be back in such brush and they're so skittish and so on. But anyway, usually with, with thrushes at you know, this time of year, it's just wonderful. They fill the woods with these beautiful sounds. Um, so I'll play you a sound. This is off of uh, um, identification audio that we have here. I hope it's not too, let me turn this down so it's not too loud. Wood thrush. There. Uh, question check here. Uh, I think we're just okay. Let's com comments to each other. Some of them. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so, Kara Kara down in in Texas, um, um, in in South. Uh, this one is from Costa Rica, actually. But anyway, uh, it feeds um, quite differently than some of the other raptors in the sense that it can walk along and, and feed rather than say diving like a, like a falcon. Um, love these guys, the, the skimmers with the long bills to be able to fly like that. Uh, they're similar in, an, in the sense of some of the other birds that, that have to get in the water. Notice the extreme length of the, the wings there, to be able to go very high well above its body so that it wing beat doesn't have to go below its body like swallows for instance can bring their wing beats below their body but if you're if you're flying along like this looking for fish to grab uh, you have to be able to have a wing structure to be able to lift way up and then bring it down about level with your body and then bring it way back up so they've adapted for this and then to be able to force the head forward and down from its body pulling water and then catching a fish that could pull its neck is just an astounding feat. So um, we did work, um, one of our friends was, uh, lives in New Mexico, was on the Paragon Recovery Program for the United States after the DDT uh, usage was stopped. And so he's able to assist us to be able to go and find where falcons are flying. He, he does, he's a falconer as well. So again, multiple stories, thinking about feeding, what birds do. Um, and then um, the bird on the left looking in mud for worms and grubs. Uh, the one on the right was just an incredibly lucky shot. I was photographing the um, American Red Start male there uh, when he suddenly, and you can see blurred up at the top, he suddenly flipped upside down to go after the bug that's flying down on the bottom there. And uh, fortunately, and I don't claim that I focused on the bug <laughs> to get it sharp, <laughs> but it, it worked out okay. So I think the uh, biggest thing is just patience. I mean, this when you, when you go over to like Forsyth Refuge uh, north of Atlantic City, this is what you'll see. The birds are down there. How do you get close? 
Uh, even with a 400 or 600 millimeter lens, you're not gonna get a good, good close up. But it makes sense to take a picture like this of a habitat, right? Like Nancy was talking about. So then the next thing is how do you get closer and closer and closer? Um, usually if they're feeding, it works very well. The second thing that you need to notice is that these birds, and this is a backwater here, but um, unlike birds in our backyard that feed based on certain times of the day, the birds over there are feeding at uh, the times of the tide. So if they're looking for worms and so on, the best, you know, if it's at high tide, go have lunch. Um, when the tide goes out, the birds are going to be coming back uh, looking for worms and crustaceans, and uh, that's the time to be able to go and do it. Now, um, this looks blurred. I have two old videos here, but I wanted to show you something relative to the challenge, even when the birds are in the open. So I'm going to run this now, and um, you'll see two different so the Dun Dunlin on the left, and I, I can't remember what the one is on the right is. So I'm gonna click this and you'll see, notice the difference in their feeding behavior, even though both of them are working in about the same pool. Again, I'll do it one more time. You'll, you'll notice the bird on the right is a runner and the Dunlin is a prober. It's easier to get pictures of probers than runners. And the longer the bill, the more likely the bird is to be a prober. So that's something, and they'll be in mud flats a lot of the time. As Tom said, these two are in the same territory and they're still uh, going after the, somewhat the same things, but the, the Dunlin is getting deeper and, and going straight into the mud to get something to eat. So probably most of you know um, that Cape May uh, with the full moon in May, um, the horseshoe crabs come and, and lay eggs uh, by the billions almost. And the shorebirds fly up from South America um, and land here. And this is a Dunlin feeding there. You saw that bird, one of the bird like it feeding in the mud um, in, on the video. So it's probing and then it will fly almost nonstop. So the Dunlin on the left hand picture is at Prudhoe Bay at the edge of the Arctic uh, Ocean where it nests. And so Cape May is one of the huge feeding stopovers, as is Grand, Grand Island, Nebraska, for uh, ducks, geese, and, and the sand hill and uh, uh, pooping cranes. So Cape May is really an amazing place. The, the gulls, the shorebirds, uh, during the month of May, but particularly around the time of the full moon, because that's when the tides are the highest, right? and it's a spring tide and the horseshoe crabs come lay their eggs and then the eggs will hatch about a month later at the next high tide. So this kind of event with, with um, snow geese in particular, Nancy had shown you, this goes over on a drive over in Maryland um, where the snow geese winter. And this was a field, we don't know what caused them to lift out. We were in a car and we stayed in the car. So something spooked them. But we, we had never seen so many geese in one spot. And this is a fairly wide angle lens. As you can see that the ducks down on the pond here are pretty small. So this is not a, a long lens. So the field of view here is really quite, quite large. And we didn't get it all. So one, one uh, thing that you might find of interest, um, uh, birds are right, so this is a Pacific loon up, up at Prudhoe Bay, photographed on a nest. This is going up the west coast here with the yellow rump warbler. Uh, and how do you know what time to go out if you're gonna optimize you know, your time? So obviously, if there's a southern wind in the spring and a north wind in the fall, the birds are gonna use that because it's the easiest thing to fly with. But this bird cast info 
uh, is very interesting. I'm going to just click on it for a minute. And let's take a look at how the birds have been migrating now. So you can see sunset and sunrise here. I think I can enlarge this. Um, well, hopefully you can see it. So this is radar. No, we can't see it. I think you, per hour. Tom, I think you only have one thing shared. Oh, that's oh, right. So look, I'm sorry. Um, let me um, stop share and go back to our screen here. I forgot about that. Okay, so you can see that okay? Yes, thanks. Okay, so let's let's run it and you'll see it's a April 9th, okay, at uh, 20 hundred. So the arrows are showing migrations. And we're not seeing a lot of arrows, but you see this, the blueness in here? Those are birds moving. So notice, notice in our area, right now, the birds are coming up at night. They're migrating at night. And so what you would expect is if you were over in a wetland here, that tomorrow morning, you would have a number of species of birds coming in and landing here. Huge migration going on down in Texas right now. Birds coming up from Mexico and across the Gulf. So anyway, it's a very interesting thing, Cornell uh, bird cast. And uh, if you wanna know when to go out, when the birds are moving, uh, when we were photographing up in Ohio, we watched this and there weren't that many birds and then there was a southern wind and we checked the radar here and it just turned bright blue. And the next morning when we got up, it was unbelievable the number of birds that were there. So anyway, um, okay, I'll go back. We're just about done here, if everybody's still okay. And I wanna share a screen. Oh, we have one question on the chat. How close do you need to get with a 600 millimeter lens? Um, well, again, you know, if, if you have um, uh, an FX camera, uh, you can do a lot of digital zooming in, right? You've got a lot of pixels to, to do a crop on a 36 or 24 megapixel Without, without a lot of grain and noise. Um, it depends on the size of the bird, obviously, you know, a pelican further away, a warbler, probably 15 feet. So um, it's, it's uh, not, not a, a trivial thing to be able to do that. One, one other thing that, um, is so is that we, we have birds that are exclusively Eastern and some that are exclusively Western. So while there's a migration going on now, uh, South to North, and then of course, North to South in the fall, these birds um, essentially don't migrate East or West. So there are some birds that, that migrate East and West. The canvasback duck will go up from the prairies in Canada and go down to Southern Minnesota and then fly straight East to the Chesapeake Bay, which is very unusual because most ducks go north and south. So the, the canvas back is very unique and you can see them out in the bay in the winter time here. So these oyster catchers, um, um, wonderful. I lo love them over on Cape May. You can see the American oyster catchers nesting out in the gravel and sand out there by the lighthouse. So the, the last thing kind of we talk about is while we're isolated, there are so many birds in our backyard, and so blue jay and white-breasted nuthatch, that you can practice, you can enjoy. We have a feeder, we plant flowers. Incidentally, the things that, that uh, hummingbirds love more than almost anything in, in addition to butterflies are zinnias. So we just got a couple of our neighbors bought us packages. They were risky enough to, to go out and do us a favor with other things that they're shopping for. And so we're gonna plant those. And then by midsummer, the hummingbirds and 
the painted ladies and just monarchs are all over that. So we plant flowers um, and vegetation and we have bird seeds, we have a bird bath. And so right now they're coming to us and it's a wonderful thing while we're locked in. If you really enjoy birds and you can't get out, they don't have those barriers. And so it's really a wonderful way to go. So we have the red-bellied woodpeckers around here. Um, took this picture of the cedar waxwing in our backyard in our crepe myrtle. So the biggest thing is, and I, I tend to do it more than Nancy, I always walk by the window whenever I get a break. I just look what's out in the yard right now. And we keep our cameras up on a desk right next to the window. And sometimes you get an opportunity like the cedar waxwings. So uh, uh, whistling ducks up, up in the tree for sunset and uh, end of a good day for us and hopefully a good program for you guys. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Does anyone have questions? I'm just gonna unmute everybody. It'll let me. <laughs> Any questions from anybody? Oh, I enjoyed it. Really good. Oh, oh, go ahead. Do you have questions? Do you want me to put the video on? You don't need video. What's the name of the flowers um, that you mentioned that you plant? Uh, the giant giant zinnias. Oh, giant zinnias. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can get different different sizes, but I mean, they get up about you know five six feet high, and oh. the, the butterflies there, the the skippers, painted ladies, um, um, not so much the sulfurs, but um, the monarchs for sure. Oh wow. Okay. Great. And uh, that that hummingbird picture that I had. Uh, at the very start. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I can bring that up again just for a second. Uh, that was on Arsenia in uh, our backyard. Wow, okay. Wow. That's gorgeous. Do you plant those from seed? We do, yeah. What? And so, you know, for it's, it's the most fun we have with birds for three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you say you uh, photographed the puffins? I don't know that we did say, but it was St. Paul Island in the Pribilof Islands in the Aleutian, in the uh, Bering Sea. So west and north of, of Anchorage. And it's uh, an interesting yeah, site out there. It's wonderful. A wonderful place to go, uh, beautiful bird watching. We saw the sun, we were there for a week, we saw the sun for maybe half an hour. The rest of the time it was cloudy and just kind of mist in the air, but beautiful flowers all over the place, beautiful little tundra-like flowers because it's mostly a kind of tundra environment there. Nice little hotel, nothing fancy, but a uh, but great place to go and explore there. And not that hard to get to. They run tourist, or at least did at that time, run tourist flights out there fairly regularly. So, so there's a question about uh, parks and nature preserves and so on. We're, we're really fortunate. Um, there, there's some woodlands uh, on the Blue Ridge Environmental Center, if you know where that is. Um, you go out nine, and then I don't remember what the route is, but you turn right so you can go 340. up. 340. Is it 340? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's just past the exit is just, or the entrance to there is just past the fire station. I forget the name of that fire station. You probably know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, near, I think it is. Yes, near. Yeah. So anyway, it, it, it's a great, great place to go hiking. Just because we don't have a lot of time, we go over to Ida Lee a lot and Morven Park and uh, Rust Nature Center. So that's not far from our house, uh, right off of Catoctin. Uh, <laughs> by Fox Ridge Park. Uh, they're, they're all closed at the moment now. I mean, not, not Ida Lee, but Morven Park and, and Rust is closed. They're not close to foot traffic. You can, you can hike in on foot, but you can't drive at, rust, at, at rust. rust, yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a meadow up the hill. Once, once you're at the top of Rust, just by, by the, the mansion there, if you head west from there, there's a 
wonderful meadow up in there that's just full of butterflies in, in August. We've done butterfly counts for a few years now. Tom has done it more recently than I, but that's one of the places that they count and mm. great diversity of butterflies. Uh, question, do we go to Huntley <coughs> Meadows? Um, yes. Front, yes, we do. A meadow lark for birds. Uh, we've only been one time and we're mostly photographing plants. Uh, so um, I, I, I really don't know how, what, what, what's good there or not, but I imagine it is. And a comment just says loud in nature can um, it has bird what? walks and education. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, Loudon Wildlife Conservancy, is that? LWC, that's a good group. Mm -hmm. Cool. And Nature Conservancy, okay, all right. Any other questions? Uh, question, do we, do we have a, newsletter. a, a yeah. newsletter? So uh, I, I can um, type our website, so every, we're doing it every week now because we thought that it might be something to help people's spirits seeing, seeing some images come in each week, but it's usually one to two weeks. And, and as you say, Sam, you, you, you've been getting them for five years, so Hank, thanks yeah. for getting it. <laughs> uh, we send it out and it's, on, it's just a moment with nature. And that came out uh, like almost 11 years ago. And I started, we started working digital. And incidentally, we didn't switch from film until 2008. And the reason was because of the photography we do, the shutter reaction time was too slow. So you would push the trigger on your shutter and it would take a fraction of a second and by then the birds were gone. On the, on the digital cameras. On, on the, the digital cameras. Right. So when Nikon came out with a 50 millisecond release from when you pushed it down to when it took the picture, now you could time the bird movement with your finger and get a picture like you're used to with film. So it was out of that we started taking them and um, Nancy and one of my sisters that's a twin, both love coffee and my sister Jan said, well, why don't you just send that and we could have a moment with nature while I drink coffee in the morning. <laughs> so that was the impetus to start for 11 years of sending out images. So anyway. That's so fun. <laughs> Well, I, th I think because we're having some problems with that moment with nature's site right now, why don't you just have them send? Oh, that's what I think. You send uh, either to you or to me at the Image Center. Okay. And just s say, I'd like to get your moment with nature, and we'll add your email. Okay. That would be fun. Yeah, that'd be great. great. All right. Well, thank you all very much. If there's thank you. This is awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Great. And I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just post your email on our private um, sure. Facebook site and then they can just get to you. Yep. That sounds good. That's All right, cool. Okay. Terrific. All right. Thank Program. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Bye, very much. Everyone. I really enjoyed it.